Hello everyone, welcome to Flowers from Fire, Ceramics and the International Art Nouveau. It's exciting to be with you and I hope that you'll be able to see this exhibition in person um, in time before it closes on September 20th. The Art Nouveau movement was really a movement. Some people have called it a style over time, but really it was a design reform movement that re really revolutionized um, the fine arts and especially craft. A lot of what was happening in the Victorian period was industrialization, industrialization led to poor design and sometimes shoddy craftsmanship, and the Art Nouveau artists really set to change that by creating beautiful handmade works of art. It's oftentimes equated with the arts and crafts movement, which is almost parallel in time period. Um, the difference is Art Nouveau is really known for its flowing whiplash lines, um, for its flowers, for its women with with tendrils of hair, all of those sorts of things that, that go with that. Um, the arts and crafts movement was really more of a simplified approach, but they're stemming from the same nature-based aesthetic. Part of the inspiration for Art Nouveau artists was really Japan. And we have a couple of works from Japan in this exhibition. Let me show them to you. When Japan opened to the West in the second half of the 19th century, uh, it really was a revelation to um, European and American artists who took design cues from what they had seen, both um, for some of them that went there firsthand, but also the manufactured export ware that came from there. And things like Japanese prints and ceramics were both enormously influential. That is the case here in these two pieces of Satsuma ware. So on the left side, we have a big vase, and on, on this side closest to me, a small bowl. Um, and there's a lot of cross-pollination in, in this compote, which the bowl on top is Satsuma ware from Japan. The bottom was made by Shreve & Company in San Francisco. So it's a combination of, of kind of east and west, and artists really looked at, at ware like this and were inspired by it. The other thing that was inspiring them, especially in France, um, was the Rococo movement. And so artists were both looking to Asia for inspiration, but they're also looking to their own historical design styles. And the Rococo movement was um, very floral and ornamented, and so some of the Art Nouveau styles coming out of that as well. So the movement right ahead of the Art Nouveau movement in Europe and America was the aesthetic movement. And these pieces, in this case, by the firm of Clément Massier, really straddle the line between the aesthetic movement and Art Nouveau. Um, like Art Nouveau artists, the aesthetic artists really looked to Japan for inspiration, and these pieces are all looking specifically to Japanese lacquerware. Um, you can see that in the golden gold of this undersea motif. This, this vase here has spiders on it, um, and one of them is about to attack a fly. And then on the one over here, it has thistles. And this one in particular was designed by an artist named Lucien Levy Dermer. And Lucien Levy Dermer was not only a ceramic designer, but he was a painter and he was a, a draftsman. And this drawing of this woman with the red hair is by Lucien Levy Dermer. Um, Dermer is really considered a symbolist artist, and symbolism in art history uh, was running parallel to Impressionism, but it was a totally different style, whereas the Impressionists were interested in light and color and air and science. The symbolists were really interested in um, evocations of mood and the ineffable and oftentimes images of women, um, darker themes, very, it's a much darker movement than the Art Nouveau movement. As you can see here, this woman's expression is really telling you that um, something isn't quite right and that was really something that was very much in common with the Art Nouveau artists. Um, just the Art Nouveau artists were more of a working in the more crafts field versus the symbolist movement was considered really a painting movement. So this case is really interesting and shows the cross-pollination between the European artists and the American artists. These two pieces here are both by Clément Massier, who is the same artist that did the pieces that we just looked at with the thistles and the fish and the spiders. Um, these are just a little bit later for him, and they are showing what he became best known for. After he did the more lacquerware-inspired pieces, he started to do iridescent glazes, and he became a master of iridescent glaze. And here you have a, a pitcher with dandelion seed heads and this one with tulips on it. His influence was very vast, and he had students, um, informal and formal, and this work here is by Jacques Sicard, 
Um, Jacques Sicard was from France, but he ended up working for Weller Company in the United States. And so all the other bases in this case are by Sicard. And Sicard became really well known for his iridescent glazes, and they were so hard to make that he kept them secret. Uh, so Weller, who owned the company, Samuel Weller, didn't know the secrets, and when Sicard left the firm, he took the secrets with him. So all of these pieces here range from about 1895 to 1910, and um, this, this luster that they were able to achieve is really difficult to do and very much part of the Art Nouveau movement. Um, the glazes that they were able to create during this time were incredible, and really the beginnings in my head, um, in a lot of ways, of the studio art pottery movement. So Clément Massier was one of the foremost makers of iridescent ware in the Art Nouveau movement, but he was certainly not alone. He had um, great competitors who were equally skilled at it. Uh, among fellow French artists was this artist, Ernest Boussier, um, who made these forms for Keller and Garin. And they are beautifully iridescent, usually floral forms is what Boussier did. Um, one of the major firms is the Jolne factory um, in Hungary. And all of the rest of these pieces are by Jolne. And Jolne managed to combine incredible forms that were often sculptural like these all are, um, but then putting these beautiful iridescent glazes on top of them. And to be able to move from the, the blue at the bottom to the red at the top was a tour de force of really glaze making. Um, the factory ultimately burned, and even today they can't replicate the glazes. They, they're still in existence, but they have only managed to capture the green. Um, the blues and the, and the reds are pretty much, um, they're not able to make them anymore. And these are a great example, too, of the symbolist movement and the influence in the cross-pollination there. Over here you have a merman and a mermaid. And here you have two figures that maybe look a little like it could be something from Dante. And then this piece back in the back looks almost like an octopus, and it's inspired by the, the, the legs of an octopus sort of swirling around. Oftentimes, um, Art Nouveau artists would work with other makers, so sometimes it was ceramics combined with metal, and this case depicts that. And in this case, the metal worker, Paul Luchet, is the better known of the, of the collaborating team. And you have the metal, um, kind of like a sea nymph or maybe a mermaid, kind of reaching out towards, uh, towards kelp or seaweed. Here you have mistletoe, um, and in, in addition to the metal work, you have little glass mistletoe berries, and, and here you have a metal base, um, then ceramic that has gilding on it that makes it look like metal, so it's really a combination of materials. And to create these things that can you know, incorporate this sort of ornament is tricky. It's really a difficult process to do, um, and Luchet was really skilled at working with ceramic artists to do that. And sometimes we don't know who made the vase. We just know he did the metal work. The cases on either side of me both represent the work of the Amphora company or Teplitz. It's an Austrian firm and they produced many vases in a wide variety of styles. They worked with a variety of different designers. One of the best known designers they worked with was Paul Daschle and Paul Daschle did these um, forms based in nature but often very abstracted versions of nature. Uh, they worked in things like natural motifs such as flowers, oftentimes, which you're seeing here. This one actually has dandelion leaves with a snake wrapping around it. Um, the snake comes out of Darwin to a certain degree, and there's many evocations of snakes and frogs and creatures that kind of crawl out of the earth. Um, and they're thinking about you know, the, the origins of the species, which was really very much on people's mind at the time things like this were being made. These are quite different also by the Amphora company, but these pieces with jewels are looking at the artist Gustav Klimt, the very famous Art Nouveau artist who worked in Austria. Um, and so the jewels that Klimt used in his paintings, which are um, considered simplest paintings, are incorporated on these vases. And then here you have this woman sort of downcast um, it's not quite sure what she's, why she's sad, or if she's sad, or if she's thinking, um, but combining those, very much an Austrian um, take on the Art Nouveau movement. Each country kind of had its own perceptions of how, how Art Nouveau should play out, so it was different in Austria than it was in Germany and different in, in France.
This case is composed of more functional wear, although the work is so beautiful, I don't know that you'd really want to use it too much. Um, this one is a big terrain, has a spot for a ladle, could be a punch bowl as well, a butter cover, a tea cup, and a um, cup and saucer. These are by Austrian and German artists, uh, Richard Riemer Schmidt, Colum and Moser, uh, and they are both very much um, were ahead of their time in terms of design. So this doesn't depict you know, the, the whiplash tendrils and the flowers so much as it is really about modern design. And that's also part of the Art, move, Art Nouveau movement that people don't always think about, because it isn't all just about flowers and women with long flowing hair. It can be um, things like this, which are very um, forward thinking in their approach to how we think about objects. If you imagine somebody having tea in that at the turn of the last century, it would seem very modern. So this case depicts three vases by Pierre-Adrien Dalperat, who's an artist from France. And it's really emblematic of a different trend in Art Nouveau in that these are um, stoneware, they're much heavier, um, and they're much more handcrafted. This exhibition includes a whole lot of different types of things, both design-wise, but also materials-wise, ranging from porcelain to stoneware to sometimes even earthenware. Uh, Dalperat was considered really a very um, progressive artist of his day, both for his glazes, he's known for this oxblood glaze and also these blue greens, but also for his forms, which are deliberately um, sometimes crude and clunky. And here you have this twisted vase with these drips coming down. And it looks like the drips were created by the glaze, but they weren't. They were created by the clay before the glaze ever went on. So in Germany, Art Nouveau was also popular, but it was all, there it was known as Jugendstil, which is literally translates to youth style, uh, in that it was associated with younger, more emerging, more progressive artists. This company here is, um, the mark is called Kronach, uh, and these were designed by a gentleman named Adolf Oppel, and he worked for Kronach. Kronach was only in existence from 1897 to 1903, and these are all in porcelain uh, and very emblematic of what people think of as the Art Nouveau style in that they're very flowing lines and the, the association with women um, as one of the primary design motifs. Uh, women occurred in a lot of, they were in paintings, they were in mukas prints, they were in really every part of the Art Nouveau movement and this reached its apotheosis in Paris in 1900 uh, with the International Exposition there. And these are very, very typical of that. But the, the combination of the pots or pot, which are the paste on paste of the white porcelain, as you see in these pieces, um, but also with the, with the modeled glaze, um, are really pretty incredible tour de force. Um, and they were very difficult and expensive to make, and that's in part why the form didn't last very long. So Art Nouveau in Germany was very diverse. Uh, we just looked at some porcelain pieces by the Kronach company. Um, these are by Metlock, um, also German, but known for making beer steins actually, but they had beautiful Art Nouveau um, wear as both of these pieces are. This woman gazing out at some swans and some sort of Japanese irises over there. Uh, the, these are incised and then the glaze is applied within the lines, which is a very different technique than the flowing glaze we just looked at. Um, the piece that's behind them with the yellow irises, that's actually English, it's by Dalton and Company. And similar though, in the aesthetic in this case, to the Germans, um, and the piece behind that with the yellow tulips and the landscape is by Royal Bone, uh, also a German company. So there was a lot of, of back and forth um, in designs and sometimes they're, they're similar and sometimes they're quite different. So we just looked at a piece of Dalton with yellow irises on it. This is also Dalton, so completely different than what we just looked at. Um, this is called Lactolian ware, which is a reference to the white milky color. Um, these pieces behind are actually Danish and they work very well with the English piece, but from an entirely different country. Um, they were made by Royal Copenhagen and you've probably heard of Royal Copenhagen, a very famous, famous firm. Um, but this one with pansies and this one with lilies and this, and this bird. Uh, they had a whole line of Art Nouveau wares and were very skilled at it. What I love most about the pansies face is this gold edge with it dripping gold at the top just sort of makes it for me. 
One of the things that Art Nouveau ceramics often use are motifs derived from nature. And they're motifs that aren't necessarily something that today the average person would think, oh yeah, I'd like a vase with a snake on it in my house. But you have that, and it happens quite frequently. So on this vase, you have a snake sort of encircling the vase. And here, this plate by Alexander Bigot, uh, you have a frog literally crawling out of a pool of glaze. Um, and this one has chameleons, and this one has an octopus. So this idea of these sort of creepy crawly creatures were very intriguing to people. It stems in part from looking at Japanese prints and Japanese art and the idea of these things in nature that have beauty even though you might not think so. Um, but also Darwin. Charles Darwin's uh, evolution of the species was really influential. And so I see it in this piece, literally this frog crawling out of a primordial pool um, you know, and about to, to, to take legs on earth and then develop into us. I think that's not an accident, and I think very much of what Bigot was thinking about when he made that. So this case, uh, these are all works by an artist named Taxile de Watt, who was a famous French artist who worked in the aesthetic period in the Art Nouveau era and beyond. He ultimately came to the United States and worked for University City. Um, and there was an cer important ceramics making center there and he was invited to the United States to teach um, as were other important international artists. These pieces are emblematic of what he did when he was still working for Sev in France and they are, uh, all of them except for the green vase in the back, have pot sur pot and pot sur pot literally means paste on paste and he would create these incredible glazes with these oftentimes crystalline forms um, or crystalline glazes and the pots or pot is really building up almost like a cameo this sort of paste on paste and he does it oftentimes with little pooty figures here he's using a sort of mask um, and there are little pooty figures on the back one there and pooty are just kind of like little cupids um, but he was really skilled at this. And then later, when he, be he would do things that were more based in nature, like gourd forms and things like that. So quite a diverse artist and worked a very long time. He ultimately, after University City, returned um, back, to, back to France and continued to make the work there for Sev Manufactory, which is one of the most famous ceramic makers of all time. Um, why don't we go and we'll look at an artist that worked with Taxil de Watt, which was Frederick Curtin Reed. They both worked at University City. So in the realm of cross-pollination, one of the artists that really moved around a lot was Frederick Curtin Reed. He's a very important artist. He's often known for his squeeze bag technique, which is almost like cake decorating. He would apply the glaze with a literal squeeze bag, and you see that relief on those pieces. As I said, he moved a lot. He ultimately ended up in California and was working for Arequipa Pottery, uh, which this piece right here closest to me is from Arequipa. And this sort of brings up that Arequipa was part of a tuberculosis sanatorium in the um, in the Marin County area. And they really made these things to encourage people, um, their health. Uh, sometimes it encouraged women to earn a, to learn, learn a trade. Uh, so there was, especially in pots like these, kind of a social um, aspect to creating them. And that's more true with the American artists than it is necessarily with the Europeans. Um, it also was true with Newcomb College, which was part of um, Sophie Newcomb school and it was it was really trying to design things that that gave um, people work um, and gave them something else to do this piece right here is by one of the most famous american companies it's by rookwood company out of cincinnati uh, the designer is carl schmidt uh, it was a very big company that produced many many pots over the years uh, went on for quite a long time um, and some some artists that work for them are better known than others carl schmidt was best known for his flowers generally and this is actually a lamp base. This piece is interesting. It's a recent acquisition um, for the Crocker. It was given by the Sacramento Pioneer Association. It's an extremely rare object and unusual um, because it represents the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco. And it was actually shown at that World's Fair. It represents the 13th labor of Hercules. And he is pushing apart the land where the Panama Canal was going to be dug. 
Uh, and that was really what was the um, PPIE was celebrating the Panama Pacific International Exposition was the um, building of the Panama Canal, but also the rebirth of San Francisco after the earthquake and fire of 1906. Um, it was based on a poster. Uh, this was based on the official poster for the exposition. And even though this is meant to be where the canal in Panama is built, in the background is the city of or the the exposition itself in San Francisco. So this was made in about 1914 and shown at the 1915 fair. So we just looked at a plate from the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco in 1915. And by 1914, the Art Nouveau, Art Nouveau movement was really um, starting to, to phase out uh, with, with the war, World War I, um, and also with the coming of the more streamlined art movement known as Art Deco. And we are now back in France, and these pieces are straddling the line between Art Nouveau and Art Deco. Um, the flowers and the bees and the fish and the crabs are all coming out of Art Nouveau, but the forms, especially in ones like this, are becoming more streamlined, more machined, um, which is emblematic of the Art Deco movement. These are all from around 1915, 1917 to 20, um, and sometimes they're actually even dated 1917. What's amazing about this company, which is called Montier, um, and this one is Joan Barrel, who worked, worked at Montier, is that the combination of the iridescent glazes with the enameling, so you have these flat, shiny glazes that do not have iridescence combined with this beautiful iridescence as in this iris face over here, um, very, very difficult to do. And then to incorporate these elements of like, in this case, bees, you know, trying to gather nectar from the flowers, and this one, moths and butterflies, um, and this little bee box over here, the literally four bees on the top sort of feeding at, at a little um, honeycomb, and then dots on the vase representing the honeycomb. But I think this is a great place to end because it really is moving into the next phase of, of design, and there are deco ceramics as well, and they become much more streamlined. Um, the glazes change, uh, and you will, you put them side by side and you'll know Art Nouveau versus Art Deco because one is based more in nature and one is based more in the machine. And these, these have elements of both. 